MCCTV is largely about what happens in the classrooms of Metropolitan Community College. We also present interviews with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And once a quarter, we sit down with the president and CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce for a chat about the economic health and development of our viewing area. The conversation ahead is about what happened in the first quarter of 2020 and what a quarter it was. I'm your host, Kent Pavelka, and David Brown joins next on MCC TV. Well, welcome everybody, and to you as well, David. Normally, uh, we uh, talk about numbers, and we will today. Largely today, numbers relate to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which has affected the world, of course, and uh, has not escaped our viewing area either. Um, in dramatic terms, the effect across the country. Let's just, I'm just gonna throw it at you and say what you will about all this since our last conversation and how all of it has affected the Omaha area. Well, thanks again for having me, Kent. You know, this is a, uh, a strange time for everybody. Um, and I would, suggest that the last time we talked, we were, um, I look back and think, boy, Kent and I really didn't know what was going to come and hit us. Our crystal balls were really cloudy on that day, um, as it was for the most of people in not just the world, in this country, but the world. Um, and I think um, that this new normal that we're in has, has caused us all to reassess a lot of things that were vitally important before uh, the pandemic hit, and it's allowed us all to kind of realign priorities a good bit. In this community, though, and in this state, I think everyone probably knows uh, the numbers by now, um, but because we, we do talk numbers on, on this, um, as of um, yesterday, I think, almost 110,000 Nebraskans had uh, filed for unemployment. And that's compared to a little less than 4,500 for the same time frame last year. So a 2,500% increase in unemployment. Um, and so while I don't think anybody is surprised by that, I mean, it is a big number. And it's one thing that the Omaha market has been able to avoid largely when there are economic dislocations and recessions, et cetera, that our unemployment numbers never get really high. Uh, we don't have, as of today at least, the, the final official April unemployment numbers. Um, we should be getting those any day, uh, but we know at the end of March it was 4.2% across the state, which was a doubling of what it was the prior month. Uh, most of the unemployment um, claims were made in March, so I imagine that you know June's will be, I mean April's will be pretty um, significant, but probably not as significant as as what we saw in March at the beginning of all of this. Having said that, though, th this is kind of a, a long slog out of this, uh, and it's a a long slog for a few reasons. One, you know, it is a health problem first. You know, the, the beginning of all this was the, the virus that has caused the pandemic around the world and claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, and it was something that nobody could foresee and nobody was prepared for and uh, nobody could figure out in the short term what impact it was going to have on their businesses. The second player in this that we've never really dealt with much, except sort of on the periphery, is government guidance. I mean, we've, you know, this country is noted for um, having the Bill of Rights, having the Constitution, having these broad, important documents that kind of say that here's the framework within which we live as a country and as citizens. And now that framework had, has been uh, pushed aside or uh, pot potentially a sharp, a finer point has been put on it to say, in order to control the surge of the virus and in order to protect our citizens and not overtax our health resources, and we have to put more constraints on how Americans live their lives. And um, that hasn't been fun to deal with. And we are, I think, in week 10 now of our employees at the chamber working from home. So since March 13th, um, this my, my guest bedroom, which has become my office, um, has been where I go every morning to work and trudge out of every night when we're done. Um, it, it, it's, it's the strangest thing, but uh, most of America and, and most of Nebraska and certainly Omaha 
uh, are doing some somewhat similar. Now, if you're not in an essential industry and you're still going to work in a, a socially distanced and uh, sanitary way, people are either at home laid off or they're at home working. And, and it's a, a very a different environment for everybody to have to deal with. And then there, there's the third part of it, which is the business community and citizens' response to the federal government and state government and local government guidelines. Some people respond to it really well. I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. It's good for my family. It's good for my neighbors. Other people have kind of in recent years, recent months, excuse me, recent weeks have kind of railed against that and said, I want to do what I want to do, want to do it how I want to do it. And um, I think it's time to open everything back up again. So you know, we find ourselves in this weird situation where those things that we always counted on, the freedom to do what we want to do within the broad guidelines of our, of our system are now being curtailed. And so um, that has had a dramatic impact on the economy of this region, which is where the Chamber of Course spends a lot of our time worrying about what the economy is going to look like. And uh, you know, we are seeing um, still a lot of activity on the economic development front, which still surprises me. Mm-hmm. Economic development clients that we had been with continued forward on their, on their projects. And we've had several new projects start since we basically went home to work um, you know, in March. Uh, and so that activity continues. Our small businesses are being really negatively impacted, trying to figure out how they can survive this process that we're going through and how much longer they can survive it. Um, and we've turned to the federal government in a way we've never turned in this community to say, help, we need money, we need resources, we need regu- regulations that protect businesses when they go back to business. We, we actually even go to OSHA and say, please, please, please give us some guidelines about what to do in our businesses when we come back. And then that's an unusual step for businesses to take because usually yes. the relationship with OSHA is a, uh, a challenging one. But now we're depending upon their guidance and the legal structure around them to give us uh, the tools necessary to have to work. So the world has changed, as everybody who is watching this knows. And uh, we think now our, our role for the chamber is to figure out what the path forward looks like. How do we provide information to our members that they need to reopen? And then how do we accelerate that reopening so that we not only get back to where we were from an economic perspective, but run right past that into something that's even more um, lucrative for this community and um, you know, better for the state as a whole. How, how realistic is that vision uh, what, that you just described, you know, uh, looking forward and, and getting back to where we were and, and even past that? And then, you know, the, the, a lot of the conversation has been how long, you know, if, if that is going to happen, how long will it take for that to happen? And I, obviously you, you can't be empirical about it, but what are your thoughts? Well, you know, we, we yesterday put out a We Rise um, economic recovery strategy um, that people can find um, at our website, omahachamber.org. And it's really a two-part strategy. The first is a collection of resources that um, members can use to help them make decisions about how they act within government guidelines. So the current restrictions being what the companies can reopen. They also have to be prepared to reopen. And so what is that and how do they make those decisions, create a document that they can access that kind of answers a lot of the questions about what do I need to do to open? What are the um, health considerations I need to take into consideration when I'm trying to make a decision about the safety of my employees and my customers. Um, and then when is it right from a, a, my gut and my best judgment perspective to go back? And we put all the information they need in this document. And, and I say that, Kent, because I think that's the first step towards how quickly we can accelerate out of this process is not only companies feeling um, that it's the right time and that they're prepared, um, but also the consumers feeling that it's the right time and that their potential places that they're going to shop or get services are prepared. Consumer confidence is a huge part of this. I mean, 70% of our, of our local economy and state economy is driven by consumer spending. So if we can't to a point where the consumer feels comfortable that they're going to walk into a place and it's going to be safe, 
that the guidelines that have been given to us by government um, are appropriate and sufficient, um, then this economy is going to be a long slog coming out. But if we can create an environment where there's confidence that we're doing everything right and we can d demonstrate that, then we think that there's no reason why we can't accelerate um, the process of recovery. Now I say all that with a caveat, and that caveat is you still have to do all this within health guidelines. So if, if we see a steady linear progression of the cases shrinking, the incidence of, of the positive tests coming out, if those things shrink and it's clear that the, the, the virus is on the wane, um, we can accelerate that activity given, again, government guidelines. Um, but we have to realize it's probably not going to be a linear event because there's everyone, every healthcare professional we've talked to says there's likely to be spikes in the virus. And if that's the case, then there's going to be times when we're going like this, then we're going to have to pause and kind of wait and see what happens. I mean, we hope that we don't ever have to go back a step in terms of restrictions, but there is a chance that we'll have to pause until things calm down and then continue that progression. If we're ready to do all of this, um, we think that we can identify those activities that are necessary to help accelerate that recovery. And so we've created the Thrive 2020 Task Force to look at key issues for small business, uh, unemployed individuals and talent, um, public policy, um, economic development, entrepreneurship, uh, diversity and inclusion. I mean, things that are uh, important, things we have to pay attention to so that we can continue knocking down whatever hurdles there are to a, a more rapid, successful transition out of this. And then, believe it or not, there are some silver linings coming out of this. I mean, the, from an economic development perspective, the, uh, the huge debate about medical supplies being mostly located offshore gives us an opportunity to try and bring some of that stuff back to America. And what better place in the center of the country uh, to put facilities that manufacture that stuff and distribute that stuff. So we're, we're already creating a process where we will be about the business of trying to target those kinds of businesses. And then also, you know, as, as strange as it may seem, we're seeing a huge in, increase in the number of people that are asking us for newcomer packets because they're people that are considering moving out of the more densely populated areas of the country and moving back to moving to a place that, has a less density, um, but maybe they have family nearby. So I think you and I have joked in the past about the inevitable grandmother strategy, where we um, look at all the boomerangs, the folks that have some, some family here in Nebraska, and um, use grandmothers to make phone calls and emails and letters say, come back, we want to be near the grandkids. That was always a joke that we talked through now, but you know, I'm not so sure that it's a joke anymore. This Better. notion that family wants to be in your family in times of, of stress like this gives us an opportunity for people as well as for companies who might want to get out of the more denser areas along the coast. So do I think we can accelerate past what our goals were before? Certainly. I think we can figure that out. But again, we've got to be prepared. We've got to come out based on guidelines and, and health criteria. But yeah, I think Omaha has shown us can do things that other communities can't do for a long, long time. And there's no reason why we can't lead the charge in the Midwest out of this uh, funk that we're in caused by the pandemic. It sounds to me like a marketing challenge and opportunity when we talk about the, the uh, nudging folks toward the idea of, uh, you know, living in the middle of the, of the country. Uh, you talk about this, this initiative, I, I don't know if you call it an initiative, We Rise Thrive 2020, one and the same, I guess, right? Pretty much. Yes, we created a Thrive 2020 Task Force, and its first product was the Re-Rise Economic Recovery right. Document. Its second... Uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, uh, I just think it's a great, um, a great move because, you know, the conversation, the general conversation to this point has been, are we going to open up again and when? Okay, we're going to open up partially, but no one has defined what that means. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than, you know, uh, social distancing, wash your hands. Right. And so, so I guess that's what's in the guts of, uh, of what you're talking about. You're taking that to another level, right? Yeah. So th there's a basic underlying format that says, first, here's what government needs to do to make sure that the environment we want to operate in is safe. We got to make sure we have the hospital resources necessary. We got to have the ICU resources necessary. We got to have the um, 
the ventilator resources necessary, all the PPEs, all the mechanisms, all that stuff's got to be there. And frankly, a, a whole host of testing that can tell us what's going on out there with, with the population. Assuming that that gets done, then there's this set of guidelines that, of course, the government has put out that says, here's what you can do. We've been trying to define in our document what that means. So if I'm a small business and I can go back today because the government, the governor has said I can, right. um, what do I have to have in my organization? How do I have to keep my place clean? What do I have to do about masks? What do I have to do about gloves? What about hand sanitizer? Uh, what about face shields? What about um, hospital gowns or um, medical gowns? I mean, what, do you, how, what lengths do I have to go to in my business to get it ready? Do my employees have to be six feet away from each other? Do they have to wear masks when they're just in an office, as an example? Um, can we gather in common rooms like lunch rooms? Um, can we use a common appliance like a refrigerator or a microwave? I mean, think about all those little details you that bet. companies have to decide. What we tried to do was, was itemize those for, for businesses. So they can just say, okay, if there's, here's the questions I got to ask myself and I, how I have to respond to those questions. Um, and then we've given them resources that they can look at um, for how do I find these things? If I had to buy stuff, um, where do I buy it? And we know that it's been difficult to get PPEs for medical sourcing. Um, how's the small business going to do that? And so we've given them sources on our page to show they can click here. And here's all the local companies, you know, that are either we're already in the business or in most cases are small businesses that have flipped from being a retailer for one set of products to another set of products. A good example of that is Mangelson's, who, you know, it's a craft shop for the most part. Now they're selling PPE supplies and they're using their same supply chains that they had before for products from overseas and using those supply chains to bring that stuff in here and selling tens of thousands of masks or more on a regular basis and trying to source for medical suppliers as well as for, um, for hospitals. So, and then we wanted to make sure finally, um, that there was a way that companies could sort of show that they've done this. So we're working with the National Safety Council Nebraska branch uh, to come up with some way for there to be a, a recognition of efforts that a company has made that could be reflected in a sticker or a, something that goes on the window that says certification. This company, kind of thing. This company has, has done what's necessary to keep it safe for their customers and their employees. So I think sometime this week there'll be some kind of a discussion about about that partnership too. So how do we get consumer confidence to come back? So, so the first part was how do we just help companies get all the information they need? Oh, and finally, we are blessed to have University of Nebraska Medical Center here in this uh, community. They're key and central to the national and even international response to this pandemic. They've created a tool called the PRAM, P-R-A-M index um, at the Global Center for Health Security. Um, that gives you daily updates on number of new cases across the state and in the, each of the healthcare regions across the state, including Omaha, the percentage of tests that came in positive, um, how the, what the hospital bed supply looks like, what the ICU rooms look like, what the ventilator supply looks like. So people can actually look at the data themselves and say, where am I comfortable with this data? Mm -hmm. They've done something, they've coded it red, green, and yellow, excuse me, red, yellow, and green. Red meaning we're not even close to the, the benchmark that we're supposed to be hitting. Yellow means that we're either trending downward from red to green, or we're trending upward from green to yellow. And so you've got to look at this stuff over time. But in the end, it's really good information that businesses can look at and get a real time, data has changed every day, um, indication of what's going on with the virus out in the community. So you can use that as a way to make a decision about your employees and your customers. That's, we're, that's the we're, first we're, Pardon me? So that's the first part of what the Thrive 2020 task force did was put that RISE document out there. So um, the, the initiative Thrive 2020 is a dynamic uh, proposition. That's the initial thing that you yeah. put out there. What else is going to be involved in, in Thrive 2020? And also, before we forget, where can folks access some of the information we've just talked about? Um, the PRAM and then Thrive 2020, we RISE. So if they go to omahachamber.org, uh, there'll be a specific click that you can go to for the We Rise uh, Economic Recovery Document and our COVID-19 resource page. Those two things work together in that they're both interactive. You can click on links that'll take you to information of any kind that you want. So you can find all that at omahachamber.org. Um, 
you're right about the Thrive 2020 process being dynamic. And um, we have not just started the work of the task force. First off, the document was the, the first thing that we have published, but we have been working on the talent and unemployment part of this now for two months. Uh, we've been working on the small business part of this for about that same two months. The economic development strategy for the same time, public policy for longer than that. So each of those task forces that I talked about earlier fall under Thrive 2020. They have a collection of volunteers who are engaging with each other and other business people uh, to make a difference and build a strategy that says, what are the two or three really important things that we can do to accelerate this recovery? and knock down whatever hurdles might be there. And then we're going to look at how do we find the resources for those tools, whether it's uh, stimulus money that came through the state or the county, or whether it's block grant money that came into the city, or whether it's philanthropy or corporate donations. I mean, we, our goal is to identify the most important things that need to happen now to make sure that when businesses come back, they can accelerate their process towards recovery and success. And I mean, we've, all of those groups have been meeting this. This isn't all new stuff. It's stuff we've been thinking about. Um, but now we've got it. We've got the list. Um, we officially kind of threw the committees open yesterday. And um, the hope is that those committees will meet within the next week. And that we'll begin the hard charging effort and very quickly, not only focusing their efforts, but then chasing down the resources to make those efforts work. Um, one of my notes is, uh, about something called the COVID-19 Crisis Response Resource Guide. Yeah. Have you already alluded to that in what we've talked about? Yeah, that's our, our resource page that is on the um, is on our website along with the, the We Rise okay. document. <clears throat> okay. Um, so as you as you look at this to date, as we speak, I don't know how else to put this, but what is your assessment of the damage that has been, has been done? Um, and we're not talking about just businesses. We're talking about individuals and employees as well. And, you know, obviously the focus has to be on how do we, what do we do to get over all this and how do we do it, which you've addressed. But um, I think people are, are mystified as to what really, how, how stunned we are in reality. I don't know how you measure that. Well, you know, there, you, you can look at the numbers, which, you know, are kind of stark. You know, Moody said that um, production and that the economy shrunk by about 29% in the, the end of the first quarter of this year, which is a shrinkage larger than the um, same amount of time during the Great Depression. So, I mean, actually, this is larger than five years of shrinkage during the Great Depression. So clearly something huge happened, a tsunami of pandemic that um, impacted every part of our lives. And so unemployment across the country is at 14 and a half percent. It's not that high here, thankfully, but I mean, the, the, those are gargantuan economic numbers. And so if you just want to look at the black and white, you know, there's, there's some proof positive that at least in the short term, things are, are really bad out there from an economic perspective. But having said that, the federal government has been uh, providing some resources to people that has really helped. I think the, the stimulus checks that everybody got, number one, is a big deal. It gave them confidence that they had cash in the bank that wasn't planned for. And then the PPP, the CARES Act and the PPP money that companies could apply for and give to, uh, to and basically pay to their laid off employees so that they actually had income coming in. You know, Nebraska was the top of the states in the percentage of our workforce that uh, was covered by PPP grants that was applied mm -hmm. for by our companies. 81%, I think, the last number I saw of the, the eligible employees in this state, um, we received um, dollars from the, the CARES Act. 81%. And that covers about two to two and a half months of, of time off. So the good news is there is a, a large there was a large chunk of money that came out there that went into people's pockets as though they were continuing to be paid uh, during the, the layoff or the furlough time, and th that has really lessened the the impact on the economy. People were still able to pay rent. They were still able to buy food. They were even though most a lot of uh, driving stopped, they were able to get to the stores and do everything they needed to do. So. 
uh, that, that was a huge, huge benefit um, and something that, that the federal government has never done. Um, so I think it's incumbent upon us to realize that that impact's been huge, but you know, that PPP money does run out at some point or another. And we gotta get this economy rolling as quickly as we can within guidelines and within health guidance um, so that people are gonna be able to get back to work before this uh, PPP support runs out. Right, and therein, excuse me, therein lies the rub. I mean, if you look, I don't know that there are, is such a thing as a trajectory, potential trajectory, you know, predicated on, you know, where are, where are we headed if this is significantly prolonged versus where are we headed if, you know, if we snap to and are able to recover in a relatively short period of time, again, making all the health considerations into the yeah, so it, that all depends on if, if you're on the side of the, this is going to be a V-curve down and right back up again from an economic perspective, or if you're on more of the U-curve where it's going to be a little more gradual coming back up, or if you're on a, on a Nike swoosh curve where you're going to kind of be flat, 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 and then all of a sudden it's going to take off, or whatever diagram you want to use. But there are a whole lot of schools of thought out there about what this is going to look like, and the reality is nobody knows because it's all based on what happens with the pandemic. And the pandemic has got you know, two things we gotta worry about. Well, we gotta hope for, I should say. How fast can the vaccine be developed? Right. And how fast can therapeutics be created so that the, the percentage of folks that die from this shrinks to a, a much lower, lower level than this, so that it is, it is more akin to other viruses or diseases that, that seem to um, flare up from now now and then. So, um, you know, I don't think anybody knows what it's going to look like, Ken. Frankly, the stock market has been acting so differently than anybody expected. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see what the economy does, but there is no good reason why the economy can't come back. Um, it does require us to continue to be forceful about living within guidelines and watching health stuff, but if we can show that you can actually be a consumer again, and not just by sitting behind your keyboard and ordering stuff online, but we can actually get back to doing business with those local businesses we like to do business with, do it safely, get out and see our friends and family in ways we, maybe not exactly the way we used to, but in a similar way, um, this economy will start chugging along again. Um, it's just going to take some effort and some confidence building to get there. What... Uh... I mean, do you do you dream about what the next new normal is going to look like? Do you have different different views of that in your imagination? Yeah, you know, it is interesting. I think this has opened up some opportunities for us that are remarkable, um, but they're also probably challenging for some of the existing businesses that are out there. Um, this meeting we're having here today, Kent, is you know one of ten I'll have today via Zoom or some of the other five or six different um, chat. A video chat kind of opportunities that are out there. Um, and what I'm finding is that I can get to people that I couldn't get to before because they just think about a, a, the traditional going to a meeting. If yeah. you're going to come and see me, let's just say that they have a half hour drive time to get there, an hour long meeting and a half hour drive time back. That's a two hour meeting really. Um, and while it's nice to have the drive time to get your mind collected and get your thoughts collected, now we have a meeting and we click a button, two minutes later we're talking, we click it off, five minutes later I can have another meeting. And um, so I think we've learned the value of having medium sized and small group and one-on-one -on -one meetings with this video environment. And that's gonna change the way people do business. We're, we have found it to be very productive in certain categories and most businesses have. And I think you're gonna see a lot of people that use this, which means the travel industry is gonna be impacted um, there'll, there'll be uh, a, a very different no, next normal for for the travel industry than than there has been for um, for maybe other industries. Um, the other is the whole notion of working from home. Um, we were fortunate at the chamber that we had a crisis plan in place that was not anticipating something like this, but it basically said, "What if we all had to operate from home? Could we?" And aside from two of our people, we, everybody had laptops and everybody was able to go work from home. Uh, we fixed the two that didn't have laptops and so all 72 of our people now are op operating remotely. And frankly, aside from the part of our business that's about getting face-to-face -face with members and face-to-face -face with clients and 
um, shaking hands or bumping elbows or bumping fists or bumping knees, whatever, whatever the, the next salutation is going to be, um, we can do that work pretty effectively from where we are. And we're learning how to be really effective at it. So I, I just think that there's a really interesting mix is going to happen about what the percentage of people are. They're going to keep working from home just because not only they can, but they've proven that they can be really productive doing so. Um, and so I, I think these tools that we've gotten and these trends that we've seen are not going to go away just because the pandemic is fixed. Um, and there are economies to be had too, as a result. There are. There's, you know, the startup world that we continue to play a bigger and bigger hand in uh, hasn't been sitting still when since the pandemic has hit. They've all been realizing where there are things that, um, where there's gaps in the technology or gaps in the services. Even the Med Center has developed a, uh, an app called COVID-19 um, that enables employees to do a self-assessment before they go to work. That's available for, for any of us to use free. So think about that. I mean, if, if you're going to require your employees to self-assess before they come in, they've got to answer these five questions. No, I'm not sick. No, I'm not living with anybody that's sick. No, I don't have a fever. No, I'm not coughing. Um, all those kind of things. And you, you have to certify that they've actually done that. Why not do it with an app? And just think about all the rest of the applications that are going to be operating out there. So there are some silver linings here that I think will evolve too. So I think, I think it'll be a, a, a different normal. Uh, we hope that it'll help accelerate our process towards Omaha 2040. We're actually doing some planning now for whether or not that Omaha 2040 future is relevant given of the changes that we've seen in the last few months. I mean, does even that have to have a post-pandemic screening done to it to make sure that we're in the right, in the right, going in the right direction at the right pace? So yeah, lots of things are gonna change, but you know, the best things about Nebraska and Omaha are gonna be still here. We're still gonna have great people. We're still gonna have philanthropists who are remarkably committed to making this a really cool place we're still going to have relatively moderate and somewhat conservative leadership to make sure we don't get ourselves um, in a situation that we can't have the quality of life that we want. And our people have this ridiculous spirit of optimism and confidence that um, shows itself every fall when the Huskers get back on the field. <laughs> you know, that, that, that first game. Well, whatever, where, whatever that's going to look like. You I know, know. Whatever that's going to look like, but we know it's going to happen in some way. Yeah. And I guarantee you that everybody watching that first game is going to think, we're undefeated and we're going to stay that way for the rest of the season. Um, you know, given the last past experience, maybe we shouldn't be thinking that way, but there is this enduring optimism about Nebraskans and Omahans that um, will help us come out of this in a way that's going to be even better than what we were before. Very good. Two quick things. I know we both had notes about what we wanted to cover here. Anything I didn't get to that you think is important. And then for everybody watching, um, any guidance you have as to, Maybe again, it's a it's the website, whatever, the, or, or some you know whatever you think people should be doing in terms of educating themselves or taking the next step. So, only thing we really haven't covered is the fact that there are still a lot of companies that are hiring. Yes, um, and if if you go to our resource guide for job seekers um, for the Omaha Chamber, there's a list of eighty plus companies that are hiring right now. Uh, we put that up online very early on in the process. Um, because there are people looking for work and there are people that um, are hiring and we need to match them together. Uh, there will be people who, even though they're laid off now, may not have an employer to go back to when all this is done. I mean, there will be some business closures, not just those that close temporarily. And we need to figure out a way to help those folks get employed as quickly as we can and upskill them and get them trained in skills and give them really strong and paid jobs with good benefits. So we wanted to do that early on. So the resource guide for job seekers is a good place for people to go. And then finally, again, omahachamber.org, our crisis response resources uh, page is where I would suggest people go just for just about any kind of information that they would need. If they got a question and they want a credible, curated source of information that has no politics attached to it, it is literally just the best information that we could find from a variety of sources it's a good place to go to kind of get yourself centered on what the data is, is telling us out there. Very good. Thank you, David. Maybe next time we'll be sitting next to each other in the studio. If not, this has worked pretty well. You know, Kent, I appreciate you guys accommodating this this way. And thanks for everything. This has been 
unique, but we'll do this again however we need to get it done. Very good. And thank you for being with us on MCC TV. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, leadership, and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka along with David Brown for Metropolitan Community College.